Welcome to the Build the Future podcast, where we promote exciting and positive visions of the future from those who are helping build it. Today, we talk with Alex Trimbaugh, Deputy Director at Breakthrough, a global research center focused on promoting technological solutions, environmental, and human development challenges. Specifically, we touch on two facets of the future here, feeding our growing population and creating a high energy planet, but not at the expense of our climate. Let's jump right in. How could we design one of those sort of like immersive traveling experiences that promotes like a climate story, right? Because I think this is this is something that's that's missing. We don't have a centralized like source of information on like what a positive vision for climate and like energy could look like. I think if we did something immersive offline, what sort of like story could we paint, what story and picture could we paint for people? You know, there's a couple things come to mind. The first is this phenomenal project called Nuclear Reimagined that uh, Susie Hobbs Baker, who is a co-founder of the Good Energy Collective, did when she was a third way with the design firm Gensler, who, as I understand, was like the biggest architecture firm in the country or something. And they they took a bunch of the advanced reactor designs from companies like Oaklo and New Scale and actually conceptualized and illustrated what those reactors would look like in the real world. So there's like, there's one in a sort of remote Alaskan town. There's one in sort of a central uh, downtown urban hub. Uh, there's a, a whole bunch of different designs of what the reactors would look like in, you know, IRL in, in a sort of like clean, futuristic, inspiring way. Obviously, you know, sort of advanced reactors and enhanced geothermal and, and electric vehicles will all be deployed in all sorts of contexts, but especially for these technologies that we don't have yet, like advanced reactors or, or like, you know, you know, this week, they, you know, Iceland built the first Climeworks uh, direct air capture carbon removal machine in Iceland, uh, which was cool to see. And it's just like, we need more of that. We need sort of both more inspiring visuals and, as you say, sort of more in, uh, inspiring immersive experiences with these advanced sort of climate friendly next generation technologies, because most of what we think about when we think about climate change is like, storms and drought and famine and things like that. The other thing that comes to mind is, and this is something that I sort of know less about, but I, I see like on Twitter is the solar punk genre is, is I think what it's called, right? You know, sort of like, I don't think you have to be like a solar power partisan or anything to appreciate these depictions of future cities with like both, you know, like solar and, and sort of plant life and, and sort of, you know, advanced transit technology, I think we need more of that, you know, both in our sort of science fiction and in our imaginaries and like you say, in our immersive experiences, you know, the more we can have, you know, like resilient infrastructure, uh, sort of inspiring visions of technology associated with our climate discussions, I think the better we'll be. This comes back to the constant thread, which is like media shapes how we view the world. And we found ourselves in a situation where a lot of the media is, is not focused on these things. It's pessimistic it's gloomy and no wonder we're like damn what's the future going to look like because we don't have on a broad scale we don't have these anchors of possibility right yeah yeah and i i, I don't want to be like overly optimistic about it but i think an important sort of real world example of this is hurricane ida which just sort of which, which just devastated many cities in the gulf coast and along the eastern seaboard and was genuinely terrifying and painful. And, you know, a bunch of residents in South Louisiana and New Orleans are still without power. That said, many, 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 many fewer people died as a result of Hurricane Ida than died as a result of Hurricane Katrina. And I am not a civil engineering expert, but as I understand it, that's a huge amount of that is chalked up to both better sort of weather forecasting and, and early warning systems and evacuation protocols and significantly improved levee systems. Like if, you, if you're in New Orleans, I was in there... I was, at, I was at New Orleans in January 2020. They've got these levees. <laughs> you can walk on them. And it's not quite like solar punk and it's not quite like advanced reactors or flying cars or anything like that. But it is both inspiring and very effective sort of, uh, sort of climate resilient infrastructure. And I don't mean to say that that will solve all our problems. Obviously, Hurricane Ida was still devastating to New Orleans specifically and to Philadelphia and to New York. And we're not sort of completely protected from extreme weather and natural disasters. But also we have these inspiring 
construction projects, these inspiring infra this inspiring infrastructure that doesn't get mentioned. You know, all of the coverage of Hurricane Ida was about this devastation, as it should be to a degree, but a lot less of it, far less than I think is appropriate, was about all the lives saved by the tremendous amounts of, in of resilience investments that were made over the last 15 years since Katrina in New Orleans that did not completely hermetically seal the city from devastation, but also saved, I mean, thousands of people died in Katrina and many, many fewer than that died in, in Ida. I don't want to make light of it or, or shrug off the, the suffering, but it's a tremendous amount of, sh of suffering and harm that was prevented by that kind of thing. It's almost like indicative of what maybe just like a broader cultural, like, challenge which is we the the source of information again like the media is like the things we see highlight the the negative but i think a lot more people are hopeful and optimistic and are actively working on solving problems like it took some people lots of money and they had to like think about okay how do we problem solve this again Hur hurricane katrina happened this was really bad how do we prevent this from happening again how do we solve this problem and then they got to work behind the scenes without the attention without the kind of like you know rah rah like look at us we're doing good they just got to work and like lots of lives were saved as a result and yeah these kind of like so how do we tell these stories of, of like resilience and of like technology and innovation being forces for good because that's what that's what effectively happened here it's like hey this thing was broken how do we like build something better in its place yeah, versus you know, sort of just focusing on the devastation and and the uh, and the risk and the liabilities and the, and the deficits all the time. You know, I, I think we're seeing more of that in really in the sort of nonprofit sector. You know, obviously Breakthrough Institute, where I where I work, it tries to be an exponent of of highlighting sort of the progress that we've made in infrastructure and technology in modernity. Um, there's you know, there's human progress at Cato. There's this new magazine called Works in Progress. You know, there's a whole field of progress studies that Tyler Cowen is a big supporter of. You know, I think our world and data does a lot of not just, again, sort of Pollyannish focus on the positive, but tell, you know, telling stories of progress. To your question, though, I do feel like there's a little bit less of it in, quote unquote, mainstream media. And I've had a lot of conversations with journalists about this. And, you know, I think very often what they'll say is, well, like, there's no story when nobody is suffering. You know, like no one writes about the deaths from a famine that didn't happen. The thing that happened was was the hurricane. And the, and the thing that happened was the basements that flooded and drowned people and the people who were displaced and the power that was out. That's the literal news story, as opposed to, you know, the sort of regular running of human life where things didn't break or where life went on or where no one suffered or died. And so I understand the sort of journalistic impulse to focus on the thing that happened as opposed to, you know, the dog that didn't bark, but it is a problem. And being able to tell stories about progress and resilience, um, I think would be, uh, I, I should be a, uh, a major priority of whether it's nonprofit media or, or mainstream media or whatever. I feel like the, the closest it ever comes is in the sort of dying local news industry where you're writing sort of like human interest stories that, that don't, get told anymore because all of our media has, has sort of migrated to nationalized mainstream media, whether it's like, you know, New York Times or Washington Post or Time or Fox News or MSNBC or something, where it is just both sound bitey and, and, and sort of hyper focused on polarization and the negative and the, the sort of stories of resilience and progress, I think, very often get ignored. And I, I don't know how to solve that. I'm not, a, I'm not a journalist. I'm not an editor. I'm not in media. But I would be interested in talking more to, to folks in media about how to fix that problem. This brings to mind something Eric, Eric Weinstein often talks about, which is like the, the whole like gated institutional narrative, which is like, what are the stories that are kind of being agreed on to be like shared and promoted and written about? But it was also, he, he tweeted something the other day, which is like the influence of like CNN is like far, far below like most major YouTube channels. I think their reach was like 700,000 people watch like one of their primetime shows, which is wild, right? More people are watching some random influencer on YouTube than, than they are CNN. And so it's like, there's still something that seems to be missing between kind of what people accept as zeitgeist knowledge because it's not coming out of like the institutions that we've like grown to trust. So like there's this shift that's gonna need to take place. Yeah, and the demonstration of the appetite for it, right? You know, like it might be that there's 10 million people watching a certain YouTuber as opposed to like less than a million people who regularly tune in to Fox News on a given night. So like the elites are watching Fox News and reading the New York Times or, or, or whatever. So I, I feel like 
even if there's a broader reach to a bunch of sort of innovative social media, YouTube, you know, sort of uh, TikTok, things like that, there's still sort of this negative feedback loop between our elites and our elite media. I feel like we need to find a way to filter, <laughs> to filter up some of the more innovative storytelling that you see in places like social media, in places like some of these new verticals, fo- you know, focused on progress and, and things like that. Yeah, I'm reminded of just on that appetite piece, like there's that this nuclear energy influencer, Isabel Bomecki, and she just like does TikToks and like people crave that content. And she's like, she went super viral for a bunch of videos she's posted. It's like, oh, there's an interest in this conversation. And this gives me hope, right? There's like some thread here that we can pull on, which is, oh, people are asking these questions about the future. They're curious. They're they're wondering like, why are we not doing certain things? They feel like things are broken. Feeling kind of compelled to like investigate solutions. Isabel's great. I feel like what makes Isabel so effective is that, you know, because I've been uh, a nuclear proponent for over a decade, really interested in the conversations about public perception and opinion on nuclear energy. And a bunch of people have been talking for decades, really, about how to talk about nuclear, how to talk about nuclear risk, how to talk about civilian nuclear power in ways that don't turn people off or the ways uh, that, that make people open to nuclear in their community or nuclear generally. And it's just been this big fight. And then all of a sudden, like within the last 18 months, here comes Isabel Bemaki, this nuclear TikToker. She comes with a, a understanding of how TikTok works, right? About just ha- how to communicate sort of ideas to her generation and to her culture as opposed to starting with starting as like a nuclear engineer or a think tanker. And I feel like she totally upended the whole conversation about uh, about how to talk about nuclear because she comes at it from a totally different perspective. And of course, you know, if you talk to her, she knows a lot about nuclear. <laughs> it's not like she is just like a, a fan girl of nuclear. She's deeply involved with the conversations and efforts to like save Diablo Canyon. And she knows all the, the startups and all that. But also she, she, I think, I feel like she's coming to it from a different perspective and I feel like we need more of that. Yeah. I want to kind of have you riff on the kind of the, the narratives around, around nuclear. Cause this is one of the, the big questions that I, I've been exploring recently, which is like the culture seems to be shifting. I think Isabel is, is kind of one of the, the promoters of that. Like the zeitgeist is changing. People are starting to kind of have these conversations, but it seems like it's only in, you know, isolated pockets where people are able to openly talk about these things. But with all the climate stuff going on, you'd think that this would work its way up to the top and this would be part of the, the climate agenda, but it doesn't seem to be the case. And I'm curious, like, if I dare ask, like, why? <laughs> why is this not being discussed? Like, is this fear-based? Is this political? Is this like, Alex, what's going on? <laughs> well, I think it's better than it used to be. I would say it's fair to say that the Breakthrough Institute was the first ardently pro-nuclear environmental organization uh, when we sort of came out as sort of, uh, I want to say aggressive, I don't want to say aggressively pro-nuclear, but certainly certainly pro-nuclear about a decade ago. And there was a lot of pushback to that, obviously from sort of major and environmental movement, environmental nonprofits, but also from sort of environmental and elite media. And I think a lot of that has moved. You know, you see organizations like Environmental Defense Fund in favor of keeping existing plants open, even Union of Concerned Scientists, which remains pretty opposed to nuclear on a sort of nuts and bolts on the ground level, has expressed concern <laughs> about uh, the, the, the threatened uh, economics of, uh, of of nuclear power plants in the United States and the West. So I think the, the sort of environmental ground is shifting in the movement on nuclear. And I think that, uh, that we'll see more of that in this decade, especially as we start to deploy, actually see a bunch of these advanced reactors build commercial civilian plants. I think part of the answer to your question is that you know, the U.S. has barely built any nuclear for over three decades. It's There's still strong associations in the sort of public's mind between nuclear weapons and, and power plants. And we, we really just need to see the long overdue renaissance in nuclear construction. We need to sort of see Susie's nuclear reimagined campaign come to life. And I think that'll, I think in addition to the sort of slow and incremental progress we've made in nuclear over the last decade, we'll see a bigger tide turn this decade if we actually get some of these plants online. The second thing I would say is that the sort of cultural conversation about nuclear is about roughly where you describe it. But, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased with a sort of policy conversation about it. You know, you, like despite still quite a bit of opposition to, to nuclear on the sort of environmental left, you've got pretty strong consensus like in Congress that we need to invest 
in keeping existing plants open. We need the Nuclear Energy Leadership Act, the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Capabilities Act, all passed you know, during a Republican presidency. So there's bipartisan support for these advanced reactors. So at a sort of you know, a democratically elected policymaking level, there's a lot of support for, for innovation in the technology. I think, you know, to, to wrap up, I think the, the reticence still comes from mostly small is beautiful, sort of aesthetic environmentalist ideology. I think that remains far too strong a current in climate and environmental thinking. And, uh, and I think that at root, that is what prevents a lot of our sort of elite institutions, whether in advocacy or in media or, or whatever else, from more open-mindedness to things like nuclear, but not just nuclear. Can you elaborate on that, like that, that small is beautiful kind of like perspective? Because when you say that, my mind thinks of, you know, the massive solar fields and the, you know, wind turbines and like the oil fields, like the derricks, like these things take up a lot of land versus when you contrast that with uh, Oklo's concept for their reactor in that kind of cool TP looking building. It's like, that's way smaller. That's way more beautiful than all the stuff we have right now. Yeah, yeah, your mileage may vary on the aesthetics, right? But to your point, it is all just like a jumble of of ideology versus the sort of, again, IRL experience of what these technologies deployed at scale really look like. But, you know, sort of fundamentally, I think that the modern environmental movement arose in the post-war era, mostly in the United States, you know, uh, 1970s Earth Day, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, a bunch of good was done in the early environmental movement, but sort of fundamentally a bunch of elite environmental thinking was led by sort of anti-mass consumption, anti-growth, anti-humanist figures like E.F. Schumacher, like William Vogt, like Paul Ehrlich, like Amory Lovins, who create this whole sort of ideology about small scale, anti-consumption, renewable energy, not, you know, so you're using, you're using renewable energy flows instead of stocks like coal or uranium or things like that. And that, despite, I think, quite a bit of protestation from the, from the modern environmental movement, I think a lot of that sticks around in ways that create these crazy contradictions, like where, where you may think that solar power falls into your sort of small is beautiful ideology. But what we actually see is that the radical majority of solar energy comes from these solar farms in the desert or these wind farms in the hill and mountainside. Not to say that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but it is to say that the ideology that sort of convinces our elites to subsidize renewables comes largely from a sort of a, a small is beautiful background that doesn't actually manifest in reality. And on the flip side of that, you've got these sort of anti-abundance, anti-centralization, anti, anti-non-renewable anti energy that, that keeps people stuck in opposition to things like nuclear power or carbon removal uh, or things like pipelines to, to, to sort of move fuels and carbon emissions around, capture carbon emissions around, even though those things might have a smaller impact on material consumption, on land use, on mining and things like that. And I feel like, again, despite the protestation to the contrary, we're getting these sort of archetypes mixed up as we scale them from how they live in our minds to how they live in the real world. Yeah, it's like this giant clusterfuck of, of like, what should we do? And everyone, all the narratives are mixing, all the concepts are mixing, and no one's able to kind of, it seems like there hasn't been a very clear, consistent narrative, like told in the way that like people can simply latch on to, or that, that kind of dives into the nuance. Because it's, you know, you talk to people about this and they're like, oh, obviously we should do this. We're like, oh no, we obviously shouldn't do this there's like this layer underneath that if we were able to kind of dig up and reveal and talk about, we may actually be able to get on the same page about a lot of these things. Yeah, and I, I think that's true. You know, at, at Breakthrough, we're trying to sort of crack open that Pandora's box of nuance to the best of our ability. You know, one of the things, as you suggest, that's so exciting about this next generation of advanced nuclear reactors is that they're a lot smaller and that they are a lot more sort of accessible in people's cognition than these big, huge mega projects that are 30 miles outside the city or whatever. If you can sort of imagine a nuclear plant the size of a shipping container that could be sort of, you know, buried under the railroad, in, you know, like in, in the rail yard in downtown Oakland or something, it becomes a lot more human. It becomes a lot more tactile. It becomes a, a lot more sort of easy to conceptualize in a way that sort of, again, gets at that nuance, or as we like to think of it, sort of like disrupts the cognitive frames that we have for these things. Because the cognitive frames that we have for these things mostly don't serve us that well when you actually start translating those into real world infrastructure deployment, into real world sort of energy, agricultural systems, whatever. Yeah. Can you go to paint like the exciting vision that gets unlocked 
as a result of like if is is we move into this future because there's this whole like anti as you mentioned like this anti growth narrative what's the inverse of that like okay oh we should we should stop we should conserve we should like you know minimize our consumption of this kind of world of scarcity but like with nuclear and with kind of all these other innovations particularly in the the food and the the cultivated meat stuff like you're actually shifting into a world of abundance where like all these things are readily available for most people actually all people and cheaply right we're we're expanding abundance is what we're doing i mean that's the funny thing is that i feel like In the 19th and 20th century, we figured out how to supply radical amounts of affordable energy and food and settlement. You know, we've got high rises, we've got industrial agriculture, we've got nuclear plants, we've got coal plants, we've got hydro, we've got transmission lines that run for thousands of miles. We have canals, we have this whole modern industry. And at that moment, a bunch of rich people in the industrialized world decided that that's all bad, (laughs) but it doesn't bother me that much. I mean, you know, a a big part of of breakthrough is sort of pushing back against that anti-industrial, anti-modern sort of anti-mass consumption strain of environmentalism. But it doesn't bother me that much because it's fundamentally a small minority of humanity who sort of holds that anti-growth, anti-modern view. It's a powerful minority. And you you do have things like the European Union banning imports of genetically modified crops from Africa or multilateral finance organizations banning financing of natural gas systems in poor countries while they're still building new natural gas power lines in, in their own territory. So it's it's a small but powerful minor, uh, sort of minority of, of elites who are making a bunch of these decisions. But uh, what's what's encouraging to me is that it's not a it's not a break towards abundance. It's just an expansion of abundance. Uh, you know, we actually did industrialize agriculture. We did move to cities. This, the planet's over 50% urban right now. You know, the, the sort of um, level of wealth on the planet has exploded in recent decades, you know, as have abundance or have, have access to things like education and, uh, and, and sort of sufficient nutrition and democracy and things like that. And so I feel like if you tell that story, if you tell the story as as one of human progress over the broad sweep of modernity, then things like things like fake meat that can be sort of grown in high fermented volumes and casks, or things like advanced reactors, or things like enhanced geothermal systems, or big machines that suck carbon out of the air, or very high productivity agriculture, you know, aided by sort of synthetic fertilizers and precision agriculture and GMOs. Those things become sort of just extensions of the way that we have extended progress over the last 200 or so years, not some break with the balance of nature that I think a bunch of mostly very privileged Western elites pretend it is. Right. (laughs) I want to tack briefly, um, but before I do, like, I think it really is a good, I like that frame of how do we, how do we tell like the story of progress up to this point? And then like kind of expand on that. Like, hey, here's where we can go. Here's where it kind of fell off. Um, Because I think when you frame it in that light, it's something a lot more people can get excited about. It's like, hey, imagine living in 1900 and then living in like 1960 or 1969 when we landed man on the moon. Like that trajectory, like that delta between 19, over those 69 years, like is massive. And if we can continue to expand our abundance, imagine where we could go. Imagine kind of what our planet could look like 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road. I want to get your take on how we actually go about rolling out some of the, the nuclear stuff in particular. I was talking with Thomas Iden. We were kind of jamming out a bunch of ideas and he was telling me, he's like, yeah, like you have, I think Oklo is like the only company that has something in the NRC right now that's kind of being reviewed. And then he was talking about how the NRC is almost just like blocker because it's this kind of bureaucratic organization that's kind of operating on old you know, standards and seems to be the big bottleneck. I'm curious kind of what your perspective is on, on kind of how we go about rolling out these things and how we can get more innovation kind of moving into the space. Because right now it seems like it's trickling and we want to kind of open the, open the sprocket. I think that's exactly right. You know, I, I would encourage you to talk to Adam Stein, who's our senior nuclear analyst, or somebody at Nuclear Innovation Alliance who are an ally of ours, or folks at Third Way, who are sort of pretty involved in these conversations about uh, regulatory reform at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, Because you're right, the NRC is, I think, historically moderately effective bottleneck in the best way. You know, these are advanced, fundamentally sort of dangerous technologies that should be well regulated. The whole point of these advanced reactors is that they're a lot 
less dangerous and can be and are a lot more modular and, and potentially a lot cheaper and a lot and a lot more commercially competitive. And not only in the abstract do these things need, do these reactors need and deserve, I think, a more streamlined sort of practical regulatory pathway towards commercialization. But in fact, Congress has mandated through uh, through a series of, re- of legislation over the last four or five years that the NRC does reform their regulatory and licensing pathways for advanced reactors. They're in the midst of doing so right now. I think what my colleague Adam Stein would say is that they're they're making sort of halting progress in efforts to to streamline and modernize the licensing process. Um, and I think that's a that's actually a huge priority. It's a huge priority for breakthrough. It's a huge priority for anyone who is hopeful or invested in uh, an advanced nuclear future because you know sort of if left to you know sort of the union of concerned scientists and and other folks who are I'm sorry, just opposed to deployment of advanced nuclear reactors, then we, we might end up with a bunch of really innovative companies that have no pathway towards commercial reality because we're relying on an outdated regulatory process and regulatory body. And, uh, and so that's something that I think more people should be paying, paying attention to and more organizations who are, who are in favor of sort of investing in advanced reactor innovation and investing in R&D more people should be paying attention to these these regulatory questions. And that's true for things like nuclear. It's true for things like fake meat and genetic modification of, of agriculture. You know, I, I think that regulation can be an actual driver of innovation when it's done well, but it can also be a bottleneck or, or, or a, a stifling in, impact. And I think, it's, uh, I think it's often overlooked and I think it deserves a lot more attention. If like, you know, as a space or like concentrate efforts on like, on one war, if you will, would it be kind of getting the regulation like modernized or for, for some of these advanced reactors such that companies can go implement an experiment and venture capitalists can like go fund these, these experiments and fund these companies? Like, would you say this is like the thing to focus on? It's hard to say. I don't want to, I don't want to waffle away from your question, but it's certainly a major front of the war. If you know, it, it might be the principal bottleneck. You know, there's other things like my colleagues Adam Stein and Ted Nordhaus wrote an op-ed this week in the Hill, urging Congress to put back in the money for the versatile test reactor at the Department of Energy, which would be a, a demonstration facility that would allow advanced nuclear companies to test fuel cycles and fuels and reactor designs and things like that, uh, and, and sort of help demonstrate and commercialize these these advanced reactor technologies. So that's one. That's another front. And then you get outside of nuclear, you know, there's a bo- there's a whole bunch of regulations in the sort of public lands and drilling space that I know the, the enhanced geothermal industry would like to see modernized as well to make it easier, especially in the West, where we have a, a bunch of deep underground geothermal potential. So uh, there's, there's both sort of a lot of fronts where you can fight the regulatory battles. On nuclear, I do think that these NRC reform conversations are both, if, if not the front, then the the first battle that we're that we're facing this decade, um, you know, and we've got uh, obviously funding gap and and for R and D and demonstration, but fundamentally, you you might have a really sort of promising reactor design and nowhere to build it if uh, if the, if the regulations stop you. So it's an important one for sure. Yeah, <laughs> how influential do you think that the Simpsons has been on kind of the, the, the like this like how people think about the space, right? Just kind of like when we're talking about the what people think of when they think of nuclear plants. They're thinking the giant reactors, you know, and Homer Simpson, and they're just like pushing random buttons, hoping things don't uh, don't melt down. <laughs> I feel like in every presentation about good and bad nuclear communications I've ever seen, Homer Simpson falling asleep at the control panel comes up. And it's sort of, I think, widely assumed that this is a, a major association that the public has with nuclear power. I think it's an association people have. But I think the fundamental finding, and you know, my 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 former colleague Kenton De Kirby has a paper about this coming out in the next couple of months. I think the the fundamental finding in the in the sort of literature around perception and cognition and and sort of cognitive frames about nuclear is that people don't think much about nuclear. It's not like healthcare. It's not like sports. It's not like political party. It's not like wearing masks. People, for the most part, don't think about nuclear energy. If you ask the sort of general public, are you in favor of nuclear energy? I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but a majority says yes, but not a strong majority, and and they don't feel that strongly about it. If you ask them, are you in favor of nuclear energy for electricity? Just add those two words. The affirmative response rate dumps by, by double digits. People are in favor of civilian nuclear power to produce electricity. We just don't know that because the, the question is often not asked right. And because people just don't think about it very much in the same way that outside of, you know, like 
conversations like these, people don't think about where their energy or their food comes from very often, which is a blessing, by the way, not, I think, a, a problem with, with society. The fewer people that have to think about where their food and energy comes from, the healthier a society, more or less, I think, I think which is, again, I, I think the reverse of how a lot of people are, are thinking about, uh, about our sort of modern industrial systems these days. So yeah, uh, Simpsons, I'm sure has a, has an effect, but fundamentally, I think that that we and these conversations overstate both the positive and the negative associations people have with nuclear. Um, I think it's something people don't think very much about, and I think that with the sort of right framing and the right, you know, both like you know, safe and commercially competitive and sort of inspiring designs, this could be a very popular sort of industry and technology in the coming decades. See, I'm getting goosebumps right now because when I'm I'm thinking about this, like there appears to be this groundswell of interest. Right, especially as the conversations are just to touch back on what we were talking about earlier. It's like people are having conversations about climate. They're having conversations about energy. And like, I don't think it's it's kind of broken through to the mainstream yet. But if you ask people, like, to your point, like, what do you think about nuclear energy for power or for electricity? It's like people are generally in support. So it's like if we can capture that somehow and channel it into, into policy and into innovation, we could actually break through <laughs> to get to this next next kind of like level of, of kind of operating with abundance. Yeah. And it's happening to some degree, right? Like there's obviously lots of skepticism or op- uh, opposition to things like nuclear in popular culture or in environmentalist culture. But again, like Congress is authorizing regulatory reform and investment in advanced nuclear so that the act, our actual democratic institutions are already are already representative of people's general feelings about something like nuclear, which is to say they don't think about it very much and they're generally in favor of sort of investment and innovation. I think that's even more true at a sort of higher level. Uh, you know, like in environmental circles, we're having all these conversations about how sort of mass production, mass consumption, sort of economic growth are the sort of culprit behind all of our environmental and social alienation ills. And that what we need to be doing is degrowing the economy or consuming less. But if, again, if you look at our actual democratically accountable institutions, then the far left is talking about a Green New Deal, which is fundamentally a growth-oriented program for investment and job creation, not a degrowth agenda. And obviously, whatever you think of a Green New Deal, and I I have some qualms with the specifics of the various programs, again, I think we can get a little bit bogged down in these sort of academic and and sort of elitist discourses about degrowth or about anti-consumption or about technophobia when the mass public, as represented by the people we vote for to represent us, are not touching that. They're not touching degrowth. They're not touching scaling back sort of consumption um, or 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 like or like antinatalism and you know let's all stop having kids. Like our you know, we see these these discourses and I think they're sort of radically overrepresented again by the by dint of the fact that it's a bunch of privileged elite Westerners who are having these conversations and that's who's in charge of a lot of our institutions. Yeah, so so we hear hear about these things a lot more, but they're not necessarily representative of what's happening policy wise, what's happening culturally. Because like I think our country has been built on the basis of growth. And so the whole idea, like the challenges we're having now are partially a result of like this lack of growth. And so the only way out is through. We have to we have to figure out how we can continue to grow and like as problems arise, we solve them. And we continue to like move piece by piece. Okay, hey, this like new thing created this new problem. Okay, let's solve it. Instead of like hey, we got to this point. All right, we're all good now. Let's stop. Like, you know, let's stop drinking plastic water bottles because they're polluting our oceans instead of the conversation of how do we actually solve this problem? Like, can we innovate on materials? Is there some synthetic biology we can kind of, organism we can create that'll decompose this plastic? Like, what are our options here versus like just accepting the status quo? Yeah, you know, to, to some extent you understand it. You know, I think it's I think it's sort of misplaced disappointment. But you know, you, you mentioned the moon landing earlier. Uh, if you were, you know, sort of a middle-aged person at the time of the moon landing, in your sort of cultural memory, you remember the Wright brothers, you remember the Great Depression, you know, you remember pre-World War II, you remember sort of pre-television, you were also around for the moon landing, for the personal computer revolution, for the rise of the automobile and television and radios and dishwashers and things like that. That was in a lifetime. You know, a lifetime ago, we didn't have smartphones or the internet, you know, painting with a broad brush, everything else kind of looks the same. 
So, you know, this is like the great stagnation or the decadent society or Robert Gordon, you know, all, all of these, I think, fairly well-founded views uh, that both innovation, both technological and cultural, have stagnated over the last sort of 30 years. I think that there's a possibility that clean energy and agricultural innovation and AI and material science, uh, space flight, things like that might turn that around um, in the coming decades. And hopefully they will. But I, I do think that's partially behind this sort of disillusionment with growth. Like, what has growth done for you lately? If you're like a middle class family in uh, in a rich country, not a whole lot. You know, incomes haven't grown nearly as much as they did in previous generations. Income inequality is still very large. So you, and people don't compare their lives to their great grandparents lives. They compare them to their neighbors lives um, and, you know, to the Joneses and things like that. Unfortunately, I think what happens to a sect of a bunch of those, again, sort of empirically privileged people um, is that they decide that growth isn't worth it or that growth is the cause of the problem, as opposed to a lack of growth and a, and a lack of dynamism, a lack of innovation being the cause of the problem. Love it. What excites you the most about the future? What excites me the most about the future is that the benefits of modernity that say Americans or people in Europe or Japan or Korea enjoy today will spread around the world. A majority of the planet still lives on less than $10 a day. A billion people around the world still have no access to electricity. Many, many of our fellow humans don't have adequate sort of food and nutrition. It's something like 85% of the planet has never been on an airplane. You know, again, like the things that we take for granted, I mean, these conversations about the great stagnation um, or a lack of innovation, these are fundamentally sort of privileged tensions to have on, on a planet that is still largely impoverished. We've seen a radical sort of reduction in both the sort of technological, economic, and cultural poverty that our fellow humans experience around the world. We see more sort of international travel, more sort of trade in both goods and services and ideas, more sort of deployment of advanced infrastructure and advanced technology that both keep society is resilient from things like natural disasters and extremes, but also allow more humans to do more things that aren't just feeding themselves, you know, in, in sort of subsistence agriculture and, and not just keeping themselves alive. So obviously I'm really excited about cell-based meat. I'm going to, I'm going to taste some cell cellular produced meat this afternoon. I'm very excited. I'm really excited about this next generation of reactors. I'm excited about this direct air capture plant that was that was deployed in Iceland this week. I'm excited about these sort of next generation technologies that I think will help us create a more stable climate, help make humans more resilient to climate change, help sort of expand the abundance we've already created that is an overwhelmingly positive force for humanity. But the thing that I'm most excited about is that more of the people who have nothing like the access that we do, you and me, Cameron, to this type of comfort and, and abundance today will have something at, at least much closer to that level of comfort and freedom and abundance in the future. Hell yeah. Love it. Alex, where, where can people kind of find you and how can they get involved? Um, any, any calls to action for, for people listening? Yeah, check out www.thebreakthrough.org. That's the website of the Breakthrough Institute. You can find me at A Trembath on Twitter, at the BTI is our institutional account. If there's any sort of young people, young students, young entrepreneurs interested in spending a summer with us, we have a summer fellowship called Breakthrough Generation. Applications will open for that. I don't know when this episode will air, but sometime this fall. We have events, we have webinars, so check us out on, on Twitter and on, on the web, and feel free to DM me or, or reach out to me on Twitter if you're interested in learning more. Amazing. Alex, thanks for the time. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Cameron. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Build the Future podcast. If you want to support the show, please share your favorite episode with a friend. If you want to get updates on the events we're hosting, new podcast episodes, and follow along as we build the new World's Fair, you can follow me on Twitter at C-A-M-W-I-E-S-E. Until next time, go build.